Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be discussing a relatively new intellectual movement known as post-humanism. My guest, Professor Debashish Banerjee, is the editor of a newly published anthology called Critical Post-Humanism and Planetary Futures. Debashish is the Haridas Chowdhury Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures, and he is also Chairman of the Department of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. He is also author of Seven Quartets of Becoming, his interpretation of the yoga psychology of Sri Aurobindo. Welcome, Debashish. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Likewise. Post-humanism, when we first began to discuss it, I'll confess I didn't know what the term meant, but you explained to me that it is really a movement that's critical of another relatively recent intellectual movement called transhumanism. Indeed, you're right, uh, Jeff. It's uh, in relation to transhumanism, but also in relation to the larger body of humanism, uh, seen as a construct that arises from uh, the European Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So the idea of humanism is, in a way, the definition of the human as a rational being uh, that sets the human apart from the rest of nature and the rest of the Western world, in mm -hmm. a sense, and makes it into a kind of an anthropocentric reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, post-humanism is critical of that. And what we call transhumanism is actually an extension of that. So from that point of view, post-humanism is critical of what we can call transhumanism as well as of the narrow understanding of humanism as a construct. Well, as I understand humanism, Renaissance yeah. humanism, right. Uh, it's sort of the notion that uh, of the dignity of man, that man is the measure of all things. Right, and right. as I recall, it was it Pico di Mirandola yes. who, who wrote this uh, essay or oratory on the dignity of man? Who, he yes. was an esoteric thinker, so right, right. very much attuned to the ancient mystical tradition, but mm -hmm. at some point, Humanism became not just about, you know, the dignity and value of the human being. Yes. But as you point out, the, uh, the notion that what distinguishes humans yes. is, is rationality. Quite, quite true, quite true. You're, you're absolutely right, Chip, that I think in its origins in the Renaissance, it has a wider and more complex meaning. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this displacement of the human. Uh, from just being a kind of a derivative of higher transcendental law to being the imminent, uh, you know, possessor of divinity, mm -hmm. uh, that we see from the Renaissance. And it's a much more wide and complex view of the human as also possibly being able to experience, mm -hmm. uh, divinity, yeah. uh, that we find in people like, uh, Mirandella, etc. But uh, what happens over time is that become that, that it becomes uh, restricted to uh, rationality. Yeah. Man, the possessor of the reason of God, the mind of God, the faculty by which God created a world of laws. And but from the transhumanist perspective, the distinguishing characteristic of the human being is that we're going to build bigger and faster computers that will one day become fully conscious, and we can upload our consciousness into them. It's it's r really high tech pushed to the extreme. Exactly. So w we can think about technology as uh, an aspect of this uh, movement uh, of the human as a rational being. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, idea is, it, it's partly there in, there in deism as well, which is one of the founding uh, philosophies behind uh, 
the the Enlightenment and and the foundation uh, of the American Constitution. And true, true. Which is you know some of the ideas behind it is that uh, God uh, created the world but left it as it is with the human being given the. Uh, job, so to say, of perfecting it. Yes. And, uh, God gave man his mo- most prized faculty, which is reason, the faculty with which he made the world, so that humankind could understand the laws of the universe and use those laws to create a perfect world. And so this becomes the basis to some extent of the modern knowledge academy. Mm -hmm. It becomes the basis of a a humanistic understanding of science as a tool to come to know the laws of God, Mm -hmm. both in making the world and in making oneself in the, in the what and the who. Now, I originally, when I first heard the term transhumanism, right. I thought that they were talking about what you've been expressing. And I right. began, uh, on, for example, on Facebook, posting some of uh, links to my videos right. on the transhumanist discussion groups. Yeah, and yeah. I quickly learned they were offended. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they didn't want anything to do with anything spiritual. They, they, no. they saw, or even parapsychological, right. they saw that as the antithesis of what they were about. True, true, exactly. So they see, uh, so when, when we, when, when we think about, uh, trying to perfect God's world and science really as a tool of doing that, uh, though later in the academy we, we create a distinction between the pure sciences and the applied sciences, mm-hmm. a science and technology. Mm-hmm. We see that in the very motive of generating knowledge, we have behind it the will to power, mm-hmm. as Nietzsche called it, yes. which really goes towards creating a perfect world. But this creation of a perfect world is the job of technology. So mm-hmm. technology, a lot of modern uh, c- contemporary philosophers going back to Heidegger are talking about this. And even Nietzsche is talking about this. The technology is really the foundation of science. Mm-hmm. And so in a way, the circle comes, it, the whole idea comes full circle in transhumanism, which says that technology accelerates and really is the mark of our our progress towards perfection. Uh, and today we come to a technology where we use these laws to better not only the world, but ourselves. Mm-hmm. So what these people are talking about on the one hand is prosthetics, that we can replace our body parts uh, with better manufactured artificial body parts to create a perfect body, which will generate a perfect consciousness. Mm -hmm. Or we can do what you said, that is create a perfect machine into which we can somehow upload our consciousness. It has a dualistic idea of consciousness and and, and technology, but it also has this idea of technology as the mark of uh, the homo faber, Mm -hmm. the human as essentially a rational fabricator of reality. It strikes me that the flaw in that thinking, it's one of the major flaws, I think, of Western culture right. in, in general, is that technology is so powerful. And technology, frankly, it's based on materialist metaphysics. It works perfectly for technology. True, true. But then we go so far as to say that this same materialist metaphysics is the true explanation of all of nature. And and that's where we fall terribly short. You're quite right. But when we think about post-humanism, post-humanism is definitely a, a critique of this, this view. Mm-hmm. But post-humanism also tries to look at technology in a different way. Mm-hmm. So if we look at technology as a co-evolution with the human, not as we look at it now as a way by which the human colonizes the world, colonizes nature, colonizes his own psyche in a way, but uh, as a method by which we arrive at universality and we arrive at communication, at oneness with the world, then uh, it becomes a slightly different understanding of human relationship with technology. 
And so post-humanism is not entirely allergic to technology. It's not a back to nature movement, but it's critical and it displaces or changes our relationship with nature. Mm -hmm. The um, transhumanists, as I understand, have a uh, an important concept co they call the singularity. Yes. Which yes. I think what they mean by that is the point in history, which they think we're coming to very soon, right. where computers will become fully conscious. That is the uh, complexity of uh, the computer core yeah. uh, will be... Uh, equally equal the human brain and at yes. that point computers will be more human than we are exactly and it it entirely rests on what you talked about as the enlightenment definition of the human mm -hmm. as computing power mm -hmm. is it is is the human restricted to computations by the brain or is there something more to the human uh, and if you privilege that computation of the brain you exactly can see how uh, humankind as so dis, dis uh, uh, you know, I mean, defined, uh, comes into confrontation with the rest of the world that doesn't have rationality. Yeah. It's as if it, it, that world was meant to be exploited. That world was meant to be, uh, utilized for our, our benefit because we are properly computational machines. Mm -hmm. And and I think the the real trap is when we treat other humans as less than human Absolutely. because they don't seem as rational. Quite true. So in inbuilt into this notion is a kind of colonialism, mm -hmm. and colonialism therefore proceeds in that fashion where, as one of the post-colonial scholars, Homi Baba, called it, uh, non-Western peoples are seen as not quite not white. In other words, they're not quite human. They're closer to the animal in the Darwinian divide between the ape and the human. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be more on the side of the ape, just not crossing the missing link mm -hmm. into the, into the human, so to say. So, and, and post-colonialism, right. like post-humanism is, yeah. is, is a cultural critique. It's a okay. cultural critique. It's a cultural critique. Postmodernism is also a cultural critique of modernism, seen as the extension of the Enlightenment into our times. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, modernity, uh, which has brought us to this point, is also faced with its insufficiencies mm -hmm. right now. You know, which is you know the discontents of modernity, and the discontents of modernity are really due to the privileging of the rational of the rest of the psyche, of the rest of nature over our climate situation, for example, uh, we've become, uh, we've moved into a new age that we are calling the Anthropocene, because in a way we leave our human footprint upon all of nature now. Uh, and, and that footprint is largely a tinkering with nature using our rationality. Mm -hmm. But that rationality is not sufficient to understand all of nature. Mm -hmm. Um, so, from that point of view, the post-colonial critiques, uh, the idea of uh, both a, a, a kind of a rational uh, hegemony over nature, as well as a post-modern, um, you know, relativization of all cultures. Mm -hmm. Because in a way, uh, traditions also have their histories. And uh, a post-colonial attitude would be one that sought for answers, not from some kind of universal frame, but from within the traditions of the, of the colonized cultures themselves. Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds like what you're telling me is that post-humanism is allied with post-colonialism. It is allied with, exactly, it is allied with post-colonialism and in that sense a critique of transhumanism and of uh, modernity, yes. But I get the impression that it's not necessarily allied with the, this idea of postmodernism. You're, you're right. It isn't entirely allied with postmodernism because what is happening is that as we move into a world in which we privilege the human, into something that is moving towards something uh, technologically superior, we end up creating a kind of a competition 
uh, between those people who have technology to enhance themselves and those who don't. And so from the post-colonial point of view, the post-modern is not always allied with the post-colonial mm -hmm. because it forgets the inherent indigenous resources by which post-coloniality uh, can emerge into an alternative modernity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I suppose one of the most important features of post-humanism mm -hmm. is this... Uh, reawakening of uh, ancient spiritual traditions. That so this would be a kind of post-humanism, yeah. right? So we have post-humanism is a broad term that encompasses many lines of uh, going beyond the human mm -hmm. or going beyond humanism in the Western sense. As it was thought of. As it was thought of. So one of these lines is uh, you know, the, the modern philosopher Michel Foucault mm -hmm. in his book called The Order of Things. Yes ends it by talking about the human as a face on the sand that is about to be wiped out by the ocean. And what he means is this construct. He's talking about the fact that it arose due to a certain constellation of knowledge mm -hmm. and of technology in, 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 during the Enlightenment. And it has reached its point of, 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 you know, of surpassing. Mm. And in a sense, the new constructs are going to be born. So there, that is one way of looking at the post-human, the post-human as a, 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 even within the technological, the, the idea of the human is being surpassed, not through transhumanism, but through uh, a new relationship with technology. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a very important post-humanist thinker, N. Catherine Hales, uh, has a book called When We Became Post-Human. And by that she means that imperceptibly, our consciousness has already become modified due to our engagement with these uh, cyber technologies. Mm -hmm. um, we, in a sense, uh, live in an expectation which is more omniscient and, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, all the, uh, omnipresent uh, than the human. Mm -hmm. uh, so we also interact with each other using these media in ways that go beyond the consciousness of the past. Well, when you consider that over a billion people on the planet now have uh, smartphones that right. can all communicate with each other. Correct, correct. So from that point of view, we have to come to terms with another kind of human consciousness than we had before. Mm -hmm. So that, that becomes, that's both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. And that becomes an aspect of post-humanism. Mm -hmm. But from a post-colonial point of view, one way of understanding post-humanism is that we have hidden resources in our psychology mm -hmm. through which we can exceed our human limitations. And our indigenous knowledges give us uh, access to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, an, another kind of post-humanism would be what I call existential post-humanism, which is how to develop these uh, powers uh, in an ethical way, in a way that answers the problems of our time. For example, uh, a real problem of our times is our disconnect with nature mm -hmm. or with the animal world, for example, or even with technology. Mm -hmm. And if we start from a monistic premise that the one consciousness is in all things, then it becomes possible to attain to more intimate consciousness contact with these forms of reality mm -hmm. and even maybe to certain kinds of identity. So that type of a growth of consciousness would constitute a more post-colonial Indian way of looking at yoga as a post-human discipline. It, it also seems quite reminiscent of uh, romantic poetry. It does. I'd say in a way, romantic poetry was already moving towards the post-human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when, from what little I know of transhumanism, I, I believe uh, really one of the leaders of that movement is Ray Kurzweil. Right. Founded uh, Singularity University yes, uh, yes. in the San Francisco Bay Area, where yeah. you're from. Yeah. Uh, I know they're very influential. Yeah. 
Uh, but I believe he is also warned about the problems of technology, the, especially the interaction of different technologies, artificial intelligence interacting with space travel, interacting with uh, new developments in biology, that, that technology itself could uh, uh, become a destructive force and, and become out of control. I know right. he's, he's warned about that. That's quite true. I, and I think Ray Kurzweil is a complex thinker. Mm-hmm. We cannot really completely cubbyhole him into a kind of a, a sort of pure technological kind of, uh, you know, sort of advocate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think he is invested in notions that are uh, kind of emerging out of the Enlightenment. It's a kind of technosis that he's invested in, uh, a kind of a use of technology to arrive at gnosis Mm -hmm. or or go beyond the human, Mm -hmm. uh, but not an entirely uncritical way. But I think uh, there are other uh, more substantial uh, understandings of the post-human that bring us closer to a relational reality, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than a change through technology. And uh, I think existential post-humanism is, is one of those. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned the importance of yoga, and uh, the yoga tradition uh, is very explicit about the what are known as the cities, or right. the powers yeah. that the human being acquires through the practice of, Quite. of, of yoga. A big portion of the Yoga Sutras is, is, is dedicated to delineating those powers, and so much of uh, Western rationality seems to be designed to deliberately uh, treat all of that literature as mere fantasy. Quite, quite true. I, I think that's part of the rational tradition. I mm-hmm. mean, I th- and it subjugates all this knowledge that uh, it can become universal, mm-hmm. can, can actually lead mm-hmm. to a, a new kind of humanity mm-hmm. or post-humanity. Yeah. And I think uh, w- what is uh, understood in the in- Indian yoga tradition, not only through uh, the Yoga Sutra, but also to, to Tantra, as the siddhis, the powers, um, is part of a larger, uh, you know, goal of becoming. Mm-hmm. That human beings can arrive at cosmic consciousness, for example, mm-hmm. or can arrive at identity with other forms of consciousness. And I think it's these ideas with siddhis as part embedded in this entire science mm-hmm. that we have to bring into our relationship with the world right now. Because our relational reality has become insufficient. Mm-hmm. Our divided, separated reality is not uh, adequate to the interdependence that our own times have created, mm-hmm. that to some extent technology itself has created. Our consciousness is not matched to our technology. And that's what existential post-humanism is inviting us to uh, move into. And, and the fact that our technology has now become so very powerful. Right. And our consciousness may not be up to the job of, for example, uh, applying all of that technology in a responsible way. We are faced with the possibility, uh, maybe even uh, in in our lifetime, or maybe uh, in the lifetime of, of our close descendants, of uh, annihilation of, of the human race by our own hands. Absolutely, Jeffrey. And I think both you and I know you're, you're one of the leading thinkers in consciousness studies, uh, that even the word consciousness is a contested term today. Mm-hmm. Because I think within the same Enlightenment tradition, consciousness is only something generated by the brain. While what we're talking about is the fact that consciousness is ubiquitous. You have different forms of consciousness within the human. And questionably or arguably, consciousness exists everywhere. Whatever we experience as consciousness is a form of internalized consciousness. But matter is conscious. Uh, you know, the invisible realms are conscious. And consciousness is, is the very description of reality. So I think if we look at it from that point of view, which is really the indigenous point of view, whether we look at India or many of the other, uh, you know, pre-modern traditions 
of the world, mm -hmm. I think uh, we have a much better, uh, you know, opening into a post-human future. Well, it brings up, a, in my mind, a kind of a paradox, mm -hmm. uh, which is that if one accepts th this premise, and, uh, and I do accept it, yes. uh, uh, or at least I'm inclined to, sure. to do that most, uh, much of the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> lots of times not, to be, to be honest, but the, the premise that consciousness is, uh, permeates everything, mm -hmm. then it suggests to me that, you know, nothing necessarily matters. It's, it's like, uh, uh, there's a bumper sticker I've seen once that says, you know, kill them all now and let God sort, sort it out. It doesn't matter if consciousness is everywhere, then life and death. If, if you kill people, well, then, you know, they'll be reborn somewhere else. So, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it strikes me as, um, even the Bhagavad Gita, the great mm -hmm. spiritual classic of, mm -hmm. of India, seems in some way to be mm -hmm. glorifying war. It's mm -hmm. your duty. Go in and, and, and kill people. You, mm -hmm. uh, if you're hesitant to do it, then, then you're not doing your duty. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's a narrow, a limited understanding of the Bhagavad Gita, but to yeah. the bigger point yeah. that you're making, I think, uh, there are different kinds of consciousness. I yeah. mean, and th that's the big difference. I think we don't have a uniform kind of consciousness. Um, we, we can call them different kinds of consciousness, not degrees of consciousness. Mm. So physical consciousness is a kind of consciousness. Uh, the consciousness of our, of our heart, emotional consciousness is a kind of consciousness. Uh, mental consciousness is a kind of consciousness. They have different properties. And these properties have relations with each other. Uh, one of the kind of things that has happened in modern times with modern philosophies is to recognize the, the fragmented nature of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Consciousness is not just mental consciousness, but it is also not just a certain configuration of consciousness with the mind dominating the rest. Mm -hmm. Is we, you know, the, the, there's a certain kind of uh, theory called assemblage theory. Mm. And the philosopher Gilles Deleuze is one of the founders of this theory, which is that these different forms of consciousness can be separated from each other, and we can reconstitute them in ways that are beneficial, you see, according to a telos, a, a certain attractor. Then telos. He, telos, uh, an, an, an attra uh, something that attracts each of them, mm -hmm. but also all of them together. And so, uh, we, you know, when we talk about consciousness, we are not talking about something which is either uniform or to be taken as it is, mm -hmm. but something that creativity can work on to make into something greater. Not in the way in which, you know, the Enlightenment tradition using the mind and the laws of technology make a better world, but in a more holistic sense, mm -hmm. in a sense that acknowledges consciousness in different forms, in different things. Now, the, the word you use, telos, uh, yes. Uh, it's an interesting word. It's, it's related to the idea of teleology or right. having a purpose. Yeah. Or a goal. Mm -hmm. uh, there being a goal. So there may not be uh, what, what post-humanism will say uh, along with post-modernism is that there sh ought not to be overriding goals from above that are given to everybody, mm -hmm. but that we can create goals for ourselves, that goals of becoming. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, in a way, a post-human understanding of yoga. Yoga as a assemblage mm -hmm. of the different forms of consciousness in us that are attuned to a certain personal becoming mm -hmm. that takes us beyond what we are into something more cosmic or something more whole. It sounds, uh, it brings to my mind the idea uh, that you mentioned earlier of existential post-humanism. Right, right. Uh, that, that these goals are not imposed on us by nature, but uh, right. by our own choice. Exactly. So from that point of view, it is as if we are moving from a universal definition of the human to a kind of a radically plural definition of the human, mm -hmm. or radically plural definition of the becoming post-human, mm -hmm. where each individual is finding their own resources within themselves, 
and their own uh, choice yeah. from within mm -hmm. to become something else. But this something else has to have an ethical dimension to it mm -hmm. because that is exactly where our relationality with each other, with the world, with animals, mm -hmm. or with uh, technology all comes in. And unless we do it in a way in which we become equal to what is being asked of us, mm -hmm. Uh, as responsible beings of this world, uh, I think we'll end up with a failure. It sounds almost like a restatement of William James' notion of a pluralistic universe. Quite true. I, I agree. I think William James was thinking along these lines mm -hmm. uh, from 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 the nineteenth century. Yeah. And now I gather uh, that the post-humanist movement. Uh, probably contains many diverse perspectives within it then. Indeed, it does. And uh, existential post-humanism, uh, I'd say, uh, has a lot to uh, learn from some philosophers like Gilles Deleuze, who's talking about nomadic thought. It's a term that he uses, a concept, and along with it he uses ideas of becoming animal or becoming woman. Uh, and by this, what he means is that, uh, in a way, our subjectivity is not fixed. And it is uh, possible for us, uh, again, he draws on the idea of the Superman from, uh, from Nietzsche. From Nietzsche. Yeah, it's possible for us to change our consciousness in intimacy and identity with other forms of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing that he's moving towards. And uh, another philosopher who is very close to Gilles Deleuze is Gilbert Simondon, mm -hmm. another French philosopher who is no more with us. But he, he is talking about our relationship with technology. Mm -hmm. And he sees even the relationship with technology as a co-evolution. So according to Simondon, uh, we, we are beings who are, uh, in a sense, moving towards a greater future. And uh, technology is something that we are, uh, you know, relating to as a, a, a way which uh, helps us to do that, but that develops its own evolutionary lineage. Mm -hmm. And we are, in a, in a sense, midwives to the evolution of technology. But once we see that it, it's there to serve that same function of going beyond the human, then our relationship changes. It mm -hmm. becomes different. Mm -hmm. And what both these thinkers, Deleuze and Simon Don, are drawing from are Spinozan understandings of monism. Mm -hmm. That everything, in a sense, you could say everything contains everything else, but fronts a certain different configuration of, of consciousness. So material consciousness or technological consciousness would seem to be unconscious. But in a way, it has a latency of consciousness so that when we relate to it in an intimate manner, then the Simondon uses the word transduction. In other words, sites of transduction are created in which we influence each other. Mm. And in that influencing, there is a symbiotic relationship and a co-evolution that takes mm -hmm. place. Well, earlier you used the phrase... Uh, that we are allowing our own minds to become colonized Indeed. by by this um, technological rationality that we project onto nature. Exactly. exactly. And, and that seems to be uh, universal uh, across the various uh, branches of post-humanism. That's that's the main critique. We we Absolutely. cannot allow ourselves to become quite colonized that way. Yes, indeed, indeed. And, and, and we, that's the thing that we have to change in our attitude. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we become post-human through a new attitude, a new relationship with, with the world and with others and with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I know the um, some existentialists, like the philosopher Colin Wilson, talk about the robot, how we become not only colonized by <laughs> rationalist mechanical thought, but, but we become like robots ourselves. Indeed, and we are... Uh, you know, in, in being colonized or in being uh, determined 
by these ideologies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and you can see that in a way the trend of thinking towards becoming transhuman yeah. is really a extension of this thinking that we are already robots. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know. Which many people do accept. That right. We're so, deterministic so we are, machines. We are machines. We are already robots. And how can we become better robots? Uh-huh. So that becomes the idea. So it's out of a colonized mind that we want to create a, another form of colonized mm-hmm. existence. Well, it seems as if what, what you're saying is that the antidote to this is uh, both the Eastern and Western esoteric traditions, which Quite seem true. to be an anathema to the rationalist mind. Absolutely. And exactly. You're, you're quite right, Jeff. And I think that's, that's exactly where we need to critique uh, the trajectory that has brought mm-hmm. us here and open it to the subjugated yeah. forms of knowledge and understanding. Well, I, I think the beauty of it is that uh, the rationalist mind, if you push rationality as far as, as, as you can, it critiques itself. I, I mean, Bertrand Russell, one of the great rationalist thinkers, wrote right. this wonderful book, Mysticism and Logic, where right. he showed that by applying logic to the claims of mysticism, mm-hmm. Those claims uh, hold up, right? Right. So uh, one could move in that direction. Yeah. Mind can be used to go beyond mind, mm-hmm. uh, but it it fights hard <laughs> to <laughs> maintain its uh, yeah. domination. There, and there's so many other uh, technologies of consciousness that right. that can be applied. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. The growth into greater intuition, for example. That's, I think, Sri Aurobindo's view is that our movement into a post-human future, he doesn't use the term post-human, but he is also drawing on Nietzsche and mm-hmm. the idea of the Superman. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, he's distinctly uh, an existential post-human thinker. So, But he's talking about the creation of an intuitive mentality that that bridges our rational mentality with the knowledge consciousness of that the Upanishads are talking about. Mm-hmm. So how can we intuitivize all our faculties uh, through gradual exercise to come to create an intuitive consciousness uh, that will help us to move into that uh, Superman form. Mm-hmm. Well, that uh, seems to be the task, that, right, uh, or the challenge, right, that that we're faced with. Absolutely, if if we choose to accept it, right. Yes, Jeff. Devashish Banerjee, once again, a very informative and enlightening conversation. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for being with me. Sure, it's always a pleasure. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.